Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Brothers and sisters in Islam, I'm here to talk to you about one of my favorite topics, and that is the description of Jannah. Let's take a walk, insha'Allah, through this place which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised, has promised those who are God conscious in private and in open. Those of us who Imam al Nawawi says there are four fundamentals for the person who wants to enter paradise. Number one, to strive hard in worship. Number two, to pardon others who have wronged you. Number three, to restrain your anger. And number four, to abstain from the haram things as much as you can. That is the road, insha'Allah, to Jannah. And the Shaykh after me will be talking about uh, something like that, insha'Allah ta'ala. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, I begin with a verse in Surah Ali Imran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a comparison between the world we live in and the world that is next, which he has promised. Allah says in the Quran, which means, know that this worldly life is nothing but play and entertainment and decorations and competition boasting over what I have and what you have among each other and raising and gathering loads and herds of wealth and children a backbone just like a cloud that comes that pleases farmers a lot because they look forward to it and then it begins to rain and produce for them crops of abundance and then those crops after a little while wither away and then till the next season. So you enjoy it for a little bit and it's gone. This is the example of the worldly life Allah says. And in the hereafter he says, there will be heart torment and forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and with Allah is the best of rewards. But you know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says? He says, do you want me to tell you something better than all of that? Something greater than all of this that people strive for? For those who fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and abstain from the things which anger him. With their Lord are many paradises. Jannat is a plural for Jannah. Jannat is plural for Jannah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has installed many, many gardens for one single person. Beneath which rivers flow and pure, beautiful spouses and a pleasure from your Lord. And, with, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware watching everyone. Brothers and sisters in Islam, you've all heard about paradise, you've all heard about Jannah, and some people think of it as a fantasy. They can't really grasp the reality of it. Let me, inshallah, draw a picture for you and give an analogy and try my best to bring you close to the description of Jannah to the best of my ability. But at the same time, I don't think anyone has succeeded in describing Jannah because the Prophet wasallam did say, فِيهَا مَا لَعَيْنُ الرَّأَتْ in paradise, there are things that no eye has ever seen. And no ear has ever heard. And it hasn't even occurred to the heart of any creation. You know when you say khatar or khatira, it's like a thought. And when Allah is using qalb, meaning the heart, not only is it a thought in the brain, but even a thought in feelings. No one's ever experienced. You know, sometimes you say to yourself, you know, I feel like... Uh, something but I don't know how to describe it have you ever gone through that type of feeling I feel like I want to um, I want some kind of enjoyment and there's something I want but I can't name it but I feel it and I wish you could feel what I'm feeling I wish I could give it a name but you can't so Allah says even that no one has ever experienced that type of feeling there are things in Jannah like that so how can I describe it subhanallah but we can give a little tiny example of what Jannah is like brothers and sisters in Islam since my topic is a walk into Jannah, then let me begin with the verse of the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us where that walk begins. Allah says in Surah Al Zumar, and so the ones who are pious and God fearing shall be escorted line by line, rose by rose, to Jannah. You know why they are rose by rose? Because everybody will be gathered with the ones whom they used to love the most. And according to your deeds, you will be in the front row or the second row or third row or fourth row and so on and so forth. How beautiful is that picture? They are escorted by the angels, rows after rows, 
according to where they belong, according to their deeds and status. And then when they reach it, Allah says, at the doors of Jannah, and the door is opened, the angels who are standing to welcome the people, they say to them the first word. What do you think they say first thing? Peace. Because this is what we're all yearning for. We're yearning for the everlasting comfort of peace in our heart and for the rest of our life physically, in our feelings, in our ears, with what we see, with how we speak. And that's the first thing the angels say. Salamun alaykum. Peace is all upon you. Tibitum. Oh, how pure and wonderful you are. Fadkhuluha khalidin. Now enter it. Everlasting entrance. Brothers and sisters in Islam, I want to describe that moment when you're about to enter Jannah and then as you enter it, insha'Allah ta'ala. In the books of Tafsir, and I relate authentic hadiths, insha'Allah. There is a, a series of lectures I gave about the end series and there's so much information about paradise in this only 20 minutes that I have. We'll try insha'Allah to summarize it in a way that you can get a clear picture. You come to the doors of Jannah and you don't enter it straight away because guess who has to open the door? He is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he grabs the ring. Allahu alam what that ring looks like. Allah only knows the perfect description of this door. It's a marvelous door, huge door, very wide, hundreds of kilometers wide in fact, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's doors to Jannah are wide and His generosity is immense. The first one to knock on it is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the guardian behind the door, the angel asks, who is it? And he says with all humbleness, Ana Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I am Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the angel says, Bika umirta al umirtu alla aftaha illa lak, ilayk or lak. It is you who I have been commanded to not open the door to anyone but you. And the door is opened. He is the one privileged our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Imagine brothers and sisters, if you are the first group that enters with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, the other people who are waiting, you see people come in lines. And as you come to the uh, doors of Jannah, there is like a waiting area. And the doors get crowded. The doors get very crowded according to the hadith, even though they are hundreds of kilometers wide. And the people want to race in there. And there are people waiting. You know when you go first class on, uh, on an aeroplane, you're going overseas somewhere. Alhamdulillah, I got the chance to go first class once in my life. You go first class and you get to wait in this beautiful, uh, luxurious area. Special um, guests, I've even forgot the name of it. <laughs> and you get special services. So you're waiting there. And the first thing that you are given is to quench your thirst. After all this time of waiting in the Day of Judgment, you are given wine, which is mixed with ginger, to refresh yourself in the waiting area. And you are with these beautiful people with bright faces. They're all smiling. They're all cheerful. They're all telling you, come and read my book. And you say, read mine. And they say, well, you know, what about mine? Look what I've done here. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has wiped away all the sins. No one knows them. They're a secret between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you begin to boast about your books out of happiness. And no one feels jealous of anyone else for some reason. The feelings are starting to change. Because Allah says in the Quran, We, have, we will take out from their hearts every bad feeling. No jealousy, no hatred, no envy, no competition. None of that. And everybody's happy for everyone else. In fact, everyone's happy for what they've received. And then the entrance begins. Your name is called out one by one. And you enter Jannah one by one. And you are called by the best names that used to be called in this world. And by your father's names, with the best of names. As you enter into Jannah, you get lost in the beauty of what you hear, what you see, and who you meet. Everybody runs off to their own palaces, their own belongings. Our Rasul Sallallahu tells us in the Sahih Hadith that a person will go to their palace and to their property and they'll know exactly where it is. 
exactly as they knew their homes in this world and even better. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala suddenly puts in your heart the know-how of how to get to your property. You know it because it belongs to you. And everybody's busy. They want to go and see their property. They want to see their spouses. They want to see the angels. They want to see what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in store for them. So they enter and there are beautiful, imagine the beautiful sounds that you're going to hear. There's a hadith in Sahih Muslim that Israfil, the angel that blows in the trumpet, sings in Jannah. And his voice is unbelievable, like you've never heard ever. So you don't just enter paradise and it's dull, but with the most beautiful voices, fragrances, sightseeing. The standard look of Jannah, if you were to look at the floor, you know when you go outside and you're walking, there's pebbles under you, you just sort of kick them aside. In Jannah they are pearls, pearls and diamonds. Or a type of pearl and a type of, uh, you know, different types of gems that you actually stand on and walk on. And this is the most insignificant part of Jannah. So imagine what your buildings are built out of. Imagine what, there are tents in Jannah. They are like, they are actually hollow pearls. One big pearl and it's hollow. Its size is 60 miles in length. I wonder what's in there. Some of my brothers before coming here, he said, Brother, we have sisters invited. Please don't talk about Hur al-Ain. I said, how can you talk about Jannah without talk about, talking about Hur al-Ain? And just because Hur al-Ain is there, why are you afraid? There's also something for the women to, there too. We just don't talk about it. I had some students, young students, who asked me questions just like that, you know, that without thinking. They say, you know, some of the girls should say, if the boys get women in Jannah, what do the women get? Don't we get men? I say to them, oh my God, this type of a question, you can't ask it right now. Just keep it inside here if you're thinking about it. But right now, if you ask it, it doesn't sound nice. And you know what? In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, as Ibn al-Qayyim says, he's of the opinion that women get also their spouses there. And Allah says in the Quran, You will have whatever your nafs desires and whatever your eye wants to taste. Now leave the imagination up to you. In Jannah, there is anything that you wish for. Whatever you desire in your nafs. And what is nafs? Nafs has many different desires. Many different wants. It's called the nafs. The desires. And what the eye wants to taste. What it enjoys looking at and feels as though you're tasting something. That's what Jannah has in there. However, let's inshallah get there first. And then we'll talk about it. Brothers and sisters in Islam. You enter Jannah and you are escorted to your palace. And you're looking around and you see these beautiful trees, the trunks made of gold. What's that? Made of gold? Is it like the gold of this world? No. There's silver. Is it like the silver of this world? No. You look at it and you say, this is gold, that's silver, but it's not like any gold I've ever seen before or silver I've ever seen. The trunks are huge. The leaves are massive. The shade is humongous. There are trees that take a horse to gallop very fast, as in the hadith. A very fast, swift horse for three days to cross just the shade of some of its trees. So you're escorted along the way. And your eyes have already been taken away by the beauty of everything that you see. You're taken away by the beauty of the, uh, the pebbles that you're stepping on. The normal dirt that you're walking on. The saffron, the grass which you see in front of you. You are taken away and you think, is this my land? Is this my land? Are these my palaces? No, they're not. That's just the standard of Jannah. And you're going. Suddenly your face changes. Your body changes. Your appearance changes. Everything about you changes. You enter and you reach your palace. And there you see your palace minimum made of golden bricks and silver bricks. It has been kept together with musk, pure musk. How? Allahu A'lam. And the light is humongous. It emanates from the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the light of Jannah. There's no sun. The light comes from the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you reach that palace, over there, there are some people waiting for you. The people who are waiting for you, Number one is your spouse, your wife. Now the sisters are thinking, how did I get there first? Well, you've been escorted by angels 
and you're gift wrapped and prepared. You see, we have this, I, I do marriages a lot, and there are sometimes uh, situations where I get the aris, the uh, bride, groom, after I've done his uh, katbiktab, his uh, marriage, and I like to encourage him, I go, come with me so we can get the signature of the sister. You come with me and her father. And I've made that a couple of times mistakes because some, some cultures, they don't allow the groom to see the wife until I don't know when. Because they're preparing her. They're not meant, not meant to see her. The point that I'm trying to make is, just like here in this world, the bride is prepared and she has more time to get ready. Much more time to get ready until the groom comes along and then he meets her and his eyes drop out of his face and he cannot believe what he's seeing. Well, you know, in Jannah, because he looks at it and thinks, hold on, I've been talking to you for a couple of months now with your father's presence and mahrams, I know we didn't go out, no. We talk, inshallah, in the home. But right now, you look like this marvelous woman with all, because you know, she's, made, she's done up, right? This is your wife. In Jannah, she's also prepared that way. And the angels have prepared her with a beautiful dress. And she looks amazing. Now, I want to tell you something. There's a story my father told me. He says, uh, they went to a funeral once and there was an old man there, probably about 80 years old. His wife had died. May Allah subhanahu wa have mercy on her. And the shaykh said, Oh Allah, unite him and her in Jannah forever. Now the old man is crying. He says, Wallah, I miss my wife, ya shaykh. But come on, you know, it's been 70 years together. <laughs> I have to stay with her forever, sir. <laughs> then he starts talking, but I've had this trouble and that problem with her. And then I'm going to have an old woman again in Jannah. I want some of those other women up there. So the Shaykh said to him, but if you see your wife in Jannah, she's not going to look the same at all as here, nor are you. She'll be transformed. I met one of those older people and I said to him, when you see your wife in Jannah, you're going to look at her and think, oh my God, it's the Hur al-Ain, Allahu Akbar. One thread of her hair, if it were to be shown on the earth, it will light up more than the sun. In the hadith, if she spat in the, in the ocean, it will turn it all sweet. And then they tell her, this is your wife. And he'll say, Subhanallah, how beautiful she is. And they'll say, that was your wife in the former world. He says, no, 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 this is not my wife. It can't be. My other wife used to be like this, and she used to give me a headache. And whenever I came back late from work, she'd give me a Q&A session. And then uh, if that wasn't enough, she'd keep talking and talking until we fell asleep. And I have to wake up late to work and get, that's not my wife. They say, yes, it is. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken away all the negativity from you and her and all the ugliness and everything that used to exist. I'm not saying that they're ugly here. I'm saying the ugliness, whatever exists of ugliness in men and women, and we all have that. In Jannah, brothers and sisters, she will be the most desired to him, the former wife. Do you think that the women of Jannah are prettier than the women of this world who enter Jannah? I'm on the opinion that they're not. By far. By far. In fact, 70 multiples is minimum of beauty and desire and attractiveness. She is the perfect one who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given her her reward for working hard in this world. And he also. My brothers and sisters in Islam, the palaces are humongous. I can't even describe how big they are. One room in there on standard level, standard, is about 60 miles long. And how many rooms are in there? Uncountable. How many palaces are there, are there in your land? Allahu Akbar. Count. And you will keep counting, subhanAllah. Brothers and sisters, what have you got prepared there? Now, obviously, when you enter a place and you're a guest and people want to welcome you, it's an opening. You know, like when we have a restaurant that you want to open it for the first time or someone, you know, you want to go into your home or you want to receive your car. And if your husband loves you or your wife wants to get you a car, she makes it really nice and puts perfume in there and puts you a little... Um, flower in there. I think women do that these days. Allah, and I think the men do that. And then you enter Jannah, and in that palace, the angels have prepared an exquisite meal for you and your wife and the inhabitants of Jannah. There is a meal and a feast that you are going to receive as a welcome to all the inhabitants of Jannah. What is it? First of all, you get appetizers. As in the hadith, the appetizer is, and be patient with me when you hear it, it is the most tender part of the liver of a whale fish. And you're thinking to yourself, liver? I don't even eat liver here, man. I'm going to eat, eat, eat in Jannah. Is the first thing I say to you. It's a delicacy up there that makes you so hungry and wanting. Well, you might be wanting you to desire the real food. 
And when you say liver, and when you say meat, and when you say all these things in Jannah, it tastes nothing like over here. I mean, remember the first time you ever tasted a food that you don't like? But when you were a baby, you thought everything was really, really tasty. My daughter, first of all, started off on the normal milk from her mother, and then we put her on this formula milk, and now she wants the formula milk, and then you, you want to get her off the formula milk, and the first time she tastes normal milk, then she wants normal milk, then she tastes honey, and now she wants honey, and then she tastes this other food, which you and I really see as quite normal, but for the baby it's something amazing because the first time they taste. But the first time you taste something that wasn't desirable, you get an experience, and that's why you don't like it. But in Jannah, when you say liver of the whale, it's not like the liver that you taste here. It's not like the fish that you taste here if you don't like fish. But beyond your imagination, you'll say, oh my God, this fish is something else, man, it tastes like cake. Cake? Cake is nothing. And up there, this is the appetizer. And then the angels say to you, eat, eat, and you can't get enough of it. One tiny tender part of the liver of the whale feeds the whole of the inhabitants of Jannah as an appetizer. Yes. Then you get wine from a fountain called Salsabil, but it's not intoxicant. And then the feast comes along. The angels bring to you the meat of beef. It is a cat. It, it, it is a buffalo that has been grazing in the most tender parts of the grasses of Jannah since the day Jannah was created prepared for you and it will be slaughtered and then you will eat from its meat you will eat beef and you're thinking to yourself but i don't like beef in this world well in jannah it's not the same beef and guess what it's been mixed with all the spices and all the things that you love and allah has created these angels or these people who make it and they are chefs imagine being created a chef by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do that this is what you will eat and you have company the best company is your spouse brothers and sisters in islam there are other things and maidens and people who come and serve you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes them in the Quran. You will look at them as if they were pearls, beautiful light. They are young people. Are they boys? Are they girls? The ulama have given different opinions, but they are not ones as the peep haters of Islam talk about them and say that, you know, it talks about young boys that are desired. No. But these are servants for you and they bring happiness to your eyes and all they do is they want to make things good for you and they are very happy to please you and to serve you. These are your servants. You live like a king. Upon a king, upon a king, upon a king. I mean, the least person who gets in Jannah is as much as seven kings. In another hadith, he gets as much as the world by tenfold. And this is the last person who enters paradise. Brothers and sisters in Islam, who has decorated your palace? There are special creatures in Jannah whom Allah has created to decorate your palace. So forget about all the interior designers that you've ever thought of. These are the best. Allah has created them to decorate and design the interior of your palace. Colors, colors that you have never imagined, could never have known exist in there. Brothers and sisters in Islam. And then you have tours, guides, who show you around Jannah. You come past these special rivers. They are four of them. And they exist throughout Jannah for all the inhabitants of Jannah. Let alone the rivers that are specifically for you. You have your own rivers and you have rivers for all the people of Jannah who drink from. They are rivers of milk, river, a river of water that never goes off, a river of honey that is pure, and a river of wine. Again, don't think water of this world, milk of this world, honey of this world, or wine of this world. You keep drinking from it and drinking from it, and you never get enough. Like the tour that's with you will say to you, that's enough. And you say, but we haven't had enough. We keep on staying here for hundreds of years. They say, come, let's taste the fruit. So you go to taste the fruit and you find an apple, apple tree. You say, you know, I know this is an apple tree, but it doesn't look like the apple trees I used to eat. Why do I think it's an apple tree? Because Allah gives you that know-how about your Jannah. You know, it's an apple. You come to taste and you say to yourself, it's not like any apple I've ever tasted before. And every bite you take of that apple, the next bite is different to the former bite. The tour says to you, let's move on. You say, but I haven't had enough of this. Because you see, what happens in Jannah is that you can never get full. And you can never get hungry. But always, what are, you, what are you? Let's have a look. If you can't get hungry and you can't get full. If you can't ever get enough of something, but you can never... You can never get enough of something. You can never get full. You can never get hungry. You don't go to the toilet. I see the young boys and girls here. You don't go to the toilet there ever again. So you don't have to worry about your mums and dads telling you, did you go to the toilet this morning? Up there, there's no toilet. You don't need to. There's nothing that smells anymore. There's nothing that... You don't sweat anything smelly. One Jewish man said to the Prophet ﷺ, he said to him, a group of them said, 
In Jannah, you ate. He says, yes, you ate. And you drink, he says, you drink. And Prophet ﷺ said to him, you have the strength of 100 men. You even cohabitate, have intercourse, and the strength of 100 men. So there is all sorts of desires up there. Yes, all your desires are met. Then he says to him, okay, well, where does the food and drink go then? And I thought that in Jannah there's no smell and no impurities. Rasul ﷺ answered him by saying, it comes out as sweat. Now before you think smelly sweat, there is no smelly sweat in Jannah. It comes out like pure musk. I'm sure a lot of you like to pour on perfume before you go out. When you first met to get married, when you were engaged, lots of perfume. Six months down the track, I don't know what happens, but it shouldn't stop. Brothers and sisters in Islam, that sweat is like perfume and musk. It fills Jannah. And so you go, eating from the fruit. Then you come to another apple tree. You say, but we just ate an apple tree before. And he says, no, this is different. Allah says in the Quran, wa utu bihi mutashabiha. And you will be given fruits that look like other fruits, but they taste absolutely different. And you keep eating as much as you can, never get full. It's, what is only left in Jannah? Just the beautiful desire and enjoyment. That's all that's left. It's just pure enjoyment. You can never get enough of everything. You can swim in a river made of chocolate and eat chocolate fish if you want. And you will never get enough because there's no diabetes. There's no issues of overweight. There's no issues of underweight. There's no issues of anything at all. Brothers and sisters in Islam, Jannah is just pure enjoyment. All the negativities that a person feels in this life, sickness, tiredness, boredom. My son always says, I'm bored. I'm bored. In Jannah, there is no boredom. Everlasting enjoyment means a boredom does not exist. It's impossible for boredom to exist. All of those negativities are given to the people of hellfire. And everything that's left of positiveness and enjoyment is given for the people of paradise. How do I know? Allah has given us, this is what he says in the Quran, but Allah gives us an example of those feelings in our life here. You know, when you live here, as we're living, we enjoy things and we have harm from things. The same things we enjoy, we get harm from. So if you like strawberry cake or chocolate cake, hands up if you do. You like strawberry, I only got one. Strawberry? Who's for strawberry? Who's for chocolate? And they get the kids putting their hands up. It's bad for your teeth, guys. In Jannah, nothing's bad for your teeth. You keep eating chocolate, you keep eating chocolate in Jannah, and you will never get enough of it, and you'll never get sick of it. Here in, in this world, you eat the most beautiful food you like, but then at the end, you get too full. Suddenly, you feel sick if you eat too much of it. And then after that, you might hate that food after it. Isn't that right? Well, in Jannah, this doesn't happen. You're thinking about the buffalo, the poor buffalo that was slaughtered. Well, in Jannah, there's no death. So what happens to the animals that you eat? Because you eat birds over there as well. You wish for a bird and you eat it. The bird comes back alive. But you actually enjoy its meat. You might not like birds, but in Jannah, it's not the same bird. Brothers and sisters in Islam, in Jannah, you are enjoying all of this and enjoying your spouses and enjoying your palaces and all these people who are serving you and the food and the water and the fruits and all these beautiful blisses, wishing for whatever you want to wish for. Now it's taken your mind away. Someone calls out and says there is a market here where you can buy things. Buy? You actually don't buy. You just go there, you wish, you look, you like, you take. There's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that says in that market a person will see a portrait. You grab a portrait and there's a nice painting on it. Someone's painted a nice painting of this gorgeous, beautiful, gorgeous, handsome man. The man looks at it and says, I wish I looked like that man. He goes home. His wife is waiting. By the way, wives can go shopping there. I know, oh my God, shopping is a big thing for women in this world. How could it not be in Jannah then? You can go shopping. However, you meet again at home. And suddenly she looks at you and says, Hey, you look more handsome than before. You look brighter. You look very handsome. And you say to her, And you look more beautiful than you were the first time I met you. What's happened? And he says, I, I just went shopping. She says, please go shopping again and again. It's not like here, brothers. 
I know you get bored of shopping here when you go out with your wife. But over there you love to go shopping together, inshaAllah ta'ala. Brothers and sisters in Islam, when you go shopping there in those markets, you meet other people. You meet the Prophet you meet the, the, the other prophets, and you meet all the, the angels, and you meet other people with a higher place there. You meet Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali and all those other companions. You meet all these other people and you shake hands and you hug. What happens? Because their light is greater and their fragrance is greater, naturally what happens in Jannah? You attract some of their beauty and their light and you attract some of their fragrance. And that's why when you come back, you look nicer and you smell nicer. And there's also a breeze that hits. Sometimes it comes through. And that breeze carries with it a beautiful musk or a beautiful fragrance. And it increases in your beauty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to have infinite, make you a beauty in, in, in infinite levels. Beauty upon beauty upon beauty. It never ends. You're enjoying all of this, brothers and sisters. And by the way, brothers, please don't disturb me, inshallah. If I enter Jannah, Ya Rabb, I'll have do not disturb for a thousand years. But if you want to meet, inshallah, I'll come to your palace, you can come to mine, inshallah ta'ala, and we can party there all night long. In Jannah, there is no night, however. So what are we going to do? You can wish for your own little night. Why not? You can wish for your own little sleep. I'll tell you what, one companion said, Ya Rasulullah, can a woman get pregnant in Jannah? I want children. He was a better one. That's how they used to ask their questions. The Rasul Sallallahu says, a woman gets pregnant in one hour and gives birth and returns back to the way she was as if she was untouched. And there is no agony or pain if you want children. <laughs> May Allah help your wife. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you offspring a comfort to your eyes. How's that? I fixed it up before the brother follows me home tonight. Brothers and sisters in Islam. One better one called out and he says, Ya Rasulullah. Oh, sorry, another man called out and says, Ya Rasulullah, what about plantation? Can I farm in Jannah? The guy wants to farm and plow and dig and plant. He said, Rasul smiled and he said, Allahu Akbar. In Jannah, you plant the seed and suddenly the beauty of your crops begins to race with your eyes. Sabaq al meaning your eyes and the beauty and the growth, it's in a race now. You can't catch up. And then a Bedouin man said, Ya Rasulullah, Allah, he must be some muhajir on Ansari because we Bedouins, we don't like farming, man. We can go out there and farm and plow. What's wrong with you people? Wallahi, I met once a Jehovah's Witness. Her name was Maria. And she opened up the Bible. She thought it was the Bible. She showed me a beautiful picture, well, a painting of this white man and an African-looking woman. My, my son calls them brown. A brown woman with carrying apples on her head. And this white man, he was plowing. And they were looking at each other and they were smiling. And there was an, a lion that was playing with a butterfly and sheep and children and snakes. No one's harming everyone. She said to me, isn't that beautiful? I said to her, I asked her, what is that? She said, that's Jannah. That's paradise. Can't you see? There's no difference between whites and blacks. There is no difference between, there's no harm. The children are playing around the lion and the lion is playing with the butterfly. It's beautiful and peace. I said, I might as well stay dead forever. She asked me why. I said, all I see is a man plowing again and a woman carrying apples up the hill. You're going to have to go to work again? I said, paradise, there is no more work. There is no more worship. None of that ever again. I finally concluded with this, my dear sisters and brothers in Islam. So now you're taken away by all this beauty and all this... And you've forgotten about something which is the most important and the most beautiful gift that the believers are given. Because everything's so beautiful. There's one hadith that says the man, last man who enters paradise, he sees a light coming down from above and he thinks it's Allah. But it's actually his wife. Really? That's how beautiful you are. And then someone calls out to come to a gathering place. You all gather and you sit on, in different positions. Some people first class, second class. In fact, in the hadith it says that you look at the people of higher superiority like the way you see stars here because of their good actions. Everybody's sitting there and no one... No, there's no obstacles in front of you. Suddenly you hear someone and he says to you, my servants or my worshippers, are you pleased? And we say, oh, our Lord, 
we are pleased. And then Allah says, Behold, no more, no, there, is, there will be pleasure from me upon you forever, and I will never ever be displeased with you. Is there anything that is missing that you still want? And we say, inshallah, oh our Lord, how could there be anything else when you have saved us from the fire and put us into Jannah? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, there is one more promise that I have yet to fulfill. I have not fulfilled it yet. And now is the time. So you're sitting with your spouses and with all the inhabitants of Jannah in one place. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala releases the veil. And you see Allah. You see Allah. Allah says in the Quran, on that day faces will be bright looking at their Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Ibn al-Qayyim says in his beautiful poem, but in English it doesn't sound nice. What he says is, he says, they look at their Lord and suddenly there is no more beautiful thing that they have ever laid their eyes on after what they have laid their eyes on already from the beauty of Jannah than the sight of the Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you forget all the beauty that you have ever seen until this point. Allahu Akbar. And what could describe the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Nothing. Nothing. Brothers and sisters in Islam, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us this beautiful reward of the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it is a reward. It is not something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept away from us deliberately just so that he can make us يعني, like a punishment in this world or anything. But because the sight of him is a reward and it is a pleasure in itself. And Jannah is all about seeing Allah and speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finally. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make Jannah our abode. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our deeds. Brothers and sisters in Islam, you want Jannah? Then now is the time to work for it. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.